Julia Whalen is a writer, actor, and one of the premier audiobook narrators recording today. She has narrated over 400 audiobooks in all genres and has been repeatedly featured on Audiophile Magazine's annual Best of lists. She was named Audible's Narrator of the Year in 2014 and is a Grammy-nominated audiobook director. Julia won the Audio Award for Best Female Narrator in 2019 for Educated by Tara Westover and a Sovas Award for her performance of her own internationally best-selling novel, My Oxford Year. If you look at the list of Julia's accolades, it's obvious why she was presented with Audiophile Magazine's Lifetime Achievement Golden Voice Award in 2020. Julia is also a certified T sommelier. We're both a little starstruck today to be able to chat with the amazing Julia Whalen. Welcome to the first 50 pages, Julia. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So I know that um, one of the questions that you get asked pretty regularly is how you got into the business of narrating audiobooks. And it is a fun story. Um, and if you want to talk about that a little bit, we'd love sure. to hear more about that. <laughs> but our question, like this burning question that I have for you, um, is when it was that you fell in love with narrating audiobooks? Very good question. And uh, they go hand in hand. So the cute story <laughs> is that um, one of my best friends in college, her mother uh, was an audiobook producer and director for a company called Brilliance. And at m our college graduation, she happened to come up to me and say, you know, have you have an acting background? And I had just graduated with a English and creative writing degree. And she said, you might be well suited to this. Have you ever thought of doing audiobooks? And I hadn't, I hadn't listened to an audiobook. I didn't really even know what she was talking about. Um, but when I graduated, I went back to Los Angeles and um, the entertainment industry had changed so much. And I had been out of it for so long. I mean, four years is like an eon that um, it was hard to get back into. And so I was in LA and, you know, tutoring to make ends meet and kind of twiddling my thumbs. And I finally emailed Laura and I said, what do I have to do to do this? And I put together a demo and I sent it to her and she gave me uh, two YA novels to do. And I loved it from the beginning. Like it was one of those just the very first page of the very first book that I did, I thought, this is for me. This is absolutely what I love. This is everything I love. This is the like Venn diagram of performance and literature. Um, and I just, I loved it from the get. And, and I think you really have to love it um, because it sounds to me like it can be a very challenging profession. You've talked about, you know, when you're recording, it's dark, it's a small space, you're isolated. Um, and I had just this vision in my head that, oh, it must be such a glamorous job. <laughs> but I mean, you know, sorry, I'm laughing. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, you know, because I'm as a listener, you know, um, at, to audiobooks. You just imagine you in like this wonderful, I mean, I'm sure your studio is wonderful, um, but you're, you know, it's just a different kind of space um, where you spend most of your day, do, you know, when you're recording. It's very true. I, I always say that, first of all, you have to love books because you have to love all kinds of books. And especially when you're starting out, when you're just happy to get a job and get an opportunity, you're not screening necessarily for the books that you're doing. And so you really just have to love books to start with. And then I think the thing that is difficult for a lot of actors who choose to do this is that it's a very isolating job. You don't have the feedback of a live audience. You don't have the collaboration with other actors. It's a very solitary thing. And so it, it's, it attracts a unique individual who likes this, this process and this particular workflow and is creatively satisfied alone. Um, and that can be difficult. Yeah, that definitely kind of leads into um, the first question that I had for you, you know, that I'm really fascinated by the process and kind of the prep that goes into audiobook narration. I always like to research and kind of know the process of things. And I think that for listeners, this is kind of, you know, like pulling back the curtain to reveal, you know, some of the magic. Um, would you mind talking a little bit more about your process and maybe how it's evolved for you over the years? Sure. Um, the magic is is work, <laughs> as with as with most most things. The magic is is sleight of hand, um, and it's work disguised as magic. But um, 
the the prep is a close read of the text. It starts there, right? So I will get a book and my prep becomes um, reading the book, getting a sense of the author's voice, um, the tone, uh, how I might want to think in this, about ways I'm going to interpret that tone to the listener. And then concretely, I keep two lists. One is a character list with um, all of the speaking characters in the book and any biographical information about them that's important and any vocal traits that they're given by the author. And then I'm keeping a word list. And these are words that I need to get pronunciations for. And sometimes they're, you know, proper nouns. Sometimes they're author invention um, that re- I just need to know how the author thinks, saw this name being pronounced, especially in fantasy or something like that. Um, and then I go about my own research process of the words and also the characters and doing a deep dive on a- any accents I need to brush up on, anything like that. Um, and then I'll usually take a stab at recording the first five or 10 pages um, just to kind of test the theories that I've created in the prep process. And uh, yeah, so that's where the, I think the English major skill set is activated uh, most acutely is in the research and prep phase. Do you have any, you know, like must haves in the studio or any like major no no's that you're like, no, don't do that. If you're, you know, wanting to kind of start on this process Uh, for new narrators. Yeah. Any suggestions of what to avoid or what not to do? Yeah. For sure. um, yeah. Don't don't paint yourself into any corners. Like if you box yourself into a voice that you can't sustain for a 12 hour book or something, I think that's that's a big one. Be very conscious of what you can sustain without um, harming yourself. So much of what we do is our body is our instrument. All of those cliches <laughs> apply here where we can't sacrifice um our vocal health for the sake of a book and this this is like one of the very first things that i see young narrators run into is they go very low with their male voices or they scream in a you know stage way and they're they're just blowing out their instrument and making the long haul because this is long haul voiceover this is not like any other type of voiceover you have to be conscious of what you are doing to your instrument for the sake of the book that's great advice i think think it definitely really helps like really make you understand how in depth and like how much it can you know take out of you and like how much you have to put into it yeah it's a very i mean it's a funny for a job that requires you really don't move um you know they like you are you really should not be moving at all but it does take a physical toll because of the um the sitting and the the duration of what this job is it's it's a it's challenging i always feel like r- ridiculous saying that considering how many actual physical labor jobs there are but this is it takes a toll it takes a toll one of the things that is to me so impressive about your body of work is the range that you have for narrating And when you browse the list of titles that you've narrated, even in the last few years, these are some some of the most in-demand books. I I know um, just in publishing, but especially we see that in our own library for the people coming in and and making requests for things. You know, blockbuster books like The Great Alone by Kristen Hanna, um, The Giver of Stars by Jojo Moyes. And we've already mentioned Educated by Tara Westover. And two of my personal favorites, I have to mention them, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. And I just finished Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I loved both of those so much. They're so good. (laughs) Are there characters? I I know you've done over 400 audiobooks, right? And and I'm not going to ask you to pick favorites. Certainly, that's an impossible task with a list (laughs) like that, you know. But are there characters or stories that you have especially enjoyed narrating? That's such a good question. Um, I, I really... I mean, it kind of started for me. Well, actually, that's not true. I was going to say it started for me with Gone Girl and I still carry Amy Elliott Dunn 
<laughs> with me. I don't think that character goes away. I, I love that character so much. Um, but even before that, I think I did a Jandy Nelson novel. Um, it was maybe only my fourth book or something. And The Sky is Everywhere, it was called. And it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And that character, Lenny, stays with me a lot. Um, and then over the years, I mean, I think most recently, um, sure, Addie LaRue was just so much fun. And it was also a challenge. I really took that book on as I wanted to try something different with the narration there. And I kind of set that as um, a goal that I was going to experiment with something. And so uh, that book means a lot to me. It worked. Um, it, it totally oh. worked. Your experiment <laughs> you. worked. Like, thank you. I just, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I no, just have please. to tell you that the the play that you have between Addie and Luke, like the tension that you create in the story. Like, I read the book first, and then I decided to listen to the audiobook, and it just you add so much, and and it really is performance. You know, I think that's really. Like you say, you are an actor and that, you know, just really, it's probably one of, you know, my favorite character interplay in any audiobook that I've listened to. So that's just my <laughs> moment so to much. tell you She's how much I loved it. She's basically tried to pawn the bo- audiobook off on every single person. <laughs> I <am>. You <laughs> have library, to like, listen all to staff. this. She's like, so have you listened to this yet? She's like, I can give you a yeah. specific disc. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. As if the you don't person that the whole... orders the audiobooks, I'm like, okay, can we not pass out individual discs to people? Like, <laughs> I don't need to get this <laughs> that back. That way lies like, madness. Great, Let's but, not like, do that. <laughs> you know, you need to get that back. <laughs> I'm like, just a scene. If you just listen to this scene, then you'll get an idea and you will totally fall in love with this one. But sorry. Well, I... thank you. No, I really appreciate that. I really do. I think... Um, you know, I, that book is so extraordinary. And that was one of those that when I, I got it, I just, well, first of all, I was very excited to do one of these books. Um, and I had been following, you know, the the um, the gossip about the book for a long time. And I kind of, it was on my radar. Um, and I was, so, cause I was going to read it anyway, regardless of whether I was narrating it. And when I read it, I, like within 10 pages, I just was like, oh, okay, this is going to be this is going to be so much fun. And I collaborated um, with V on some of the performance choices because I wanted her blessing for what I was going to try to do with, and this is what I meant by an experiment. I was, I was figuring out how we were going to have this woman who doesn't age, but has had 300 years of life experience that does something (laughs) to someone's vocal, um, traits even if they're still technically the same age and then dealing with how her accent has been softened over those centuries and over the different places that she's lived and so there was this just kind of constant equation happening of where she was at in her own journey where the book was at how that was going to um, be communicated to the listener without being confusing Uh, and she was so supportive um, of just saying, you know, honestly, whatever you want to do with it, which is very freeing. You know, you mentioned um, Amy Elliott Dunnan from Gone Girl. And, um, you know, she's a very different character. Like, we (laughs) don't want to like her, right? I mean, (laughs) just, you know, having that opportunity to... um, you know, do a character like that. I just think it would be really fun. (laughs) It's so fun. I mean, I think, you know, look, talk to any actor, like every actor loves playing psychopaths. They're just fun. And so, you know, this was, this was, that's still probably some of the best days I've ever had in the booth. Um, And, you know, when I, when you add those up, like over the, the years that I've been doing this, certain books stand out just because the worlds were so fun and that can be anything that can be something like Addie LaRue that can be something really fast paced and you know thrillery or it can be um something where it's just relationships that I love like doing Emily Henry's books are always a joy um doing Evie Drake starts over my with my friend Linda Holmes like bringing a friend's book to life also is a lot of fun there's there's so much joy that I I'm just at this point, I'm just like so lucky that this is my job. And that's honestly how I feel about it. It can be challenging and it can be isolating, um, but it is nothing if not 
creatively fulfilling and I get to live in books. I, I just don't, I don't know how, um, I thank Laura every day, my friend's mom for seeing something in me that would be suited to this job that has become uh, my life in a way that I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine this happening. You also, you know, participate in some full cast recording or ensemble recording things too. Um, do you find that more challenging than doing, you know, your individual narration? Or do you like that energy? That, a, that you know, That's a good question. It's more logistically challenging um, because you're coordinating, you know, pronunciations or character voices or takes with other with other narrators I wish it were more creatively satisfying but most of these things are not done um with the other narrator together in the room so we're still just recording our own sections and then sending them off and they're compiled later so I I love when something comes together like um you know Daisy Jones and the Six or something like that that is that is fun because the finished product is fun but the recording of it is not um I wish there were more I wish there were more collaboration sometimes that happens I've been able like with um, some of Lauren Blakely's books I've been able to sit in a studio with another narrator and we're able to read lines back and forth and that's obviously great um but those are few and far between so on your website, you link to a really interesting interview with Carolyn Kitchener or Caroline Kitchener, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, for the Lily, which for those listeners that don't know is a product of the Washington Post. It's a destination for stories central to the everyday lives of millennial women, um, where you talk about what makes an authoritative voice and how listeners tend to trust a man speaking voice over a woman's. Do you think that the industry or at least parts of the industry are trying to, you know, kind of shift the way we think about what makes an authoritative voice? I think it is. And I think it's gotten better since I did that interview, since they did the profile. Um, and we were kind of at the beginning of it then. And I see a concerted effort in our industry, producers that take this issue very seriously. Um, the way that books were kind of revolutionized by the the own voices movement i feel that happening in audio finally which is um which is so necessary and so overdue um so i think i do think that's changing and i think but i think at the end of the day we are still limited to a certain extent by publishing and the fact that we still have most books that are written by men have more money behind them and more traction because they're usually nonfiction, which is the easier place to make money, which means that those books were, are going, because they have male authors, are generally going to be voiced by men. And it's a it's a per, self-perpetuating issue that is really rooted in publishing, which is obviously very rooted in commerce and what people, where people put their money. So I think we're doing the best we can in our corner of this industry. And I have seen a lot of change and it's... Uh, it's, a, it's coming from a lot of work from a lot of different people trying to make this happen. And that's been very gratifying. Um, and you read for a company called Autumn. Um, and they record articles for major magazines, the long form journalism from um, places like The New Yorker and The Atlantic. And you said you regularly read work by men. Um, yeah, so I think, and that's another, that, that's a good example of people who made a conscious decision early on. And I worked very closely with that company um, when it was developing, uh, not just as a narrator, but also working in in production there. And that was a conscious decision from the two founders from the very beginning saying, we want to challenge how people think of authoritative voices. And so they started giving me articles that were the kind of big blockbuster, you know, important journalism articles. And it's been interesting for me to see the response that I get when people reach out to me on social media or something, particularly men who are like, I just, I really, I hear now when I read journalism, I hear your voice in my head. And that's, that's how we start changing things <laughs> like that. That is how it, it starts moving. Um, so yeah, I think Autumn was really uh, the vanguard of, of that. That's uh, pretty cool. 
<laughs> Pretty cool to hear. No, it's it's nice. And like I said, I don't think this was ever this wasn't this wasn't an intentional thing. Like people people just hadn't thought of it. Yeah. And the same way that when I was doing casting for Autumn, I would say, you know, I, I have somebody like Dion Graham, who is exceptional, but who gets pigeonholed so often. And so it's like, if I can give Dion a piece that people wouldn't expect coming out of his, like, I'm going to do that. I want him to do pieces that are against type. Um, you know, this, but it requires that very constant, diligent, um, uh, very mindful casting. And this is a process that moves very quickly. And people are overwhelmed. And, you know, I don't fault human beings for not being able to make perfect decisions every time, but we have definitely made this a priority and I see it happening. And from some of the things I've looked at, um, just even like Twitter feeds and things like that, it really feels like the, there is a community of audio book narrators that you all really do support each other in a, a very cool way. Um, which I think is really wonderful to see. It's lovely. I have to say, like, coming out of, um, you know, Hollywood, where that's definitely not the norm, yeah. um, coming out of publishing also where people can get competitive and weird. We don't, we don't really do that. And I think it's because we've had a lot of talks together, like in groups of narrators, we get together and we are like, why aren't we more competitive with each other? Like, why are we all? And part of it is because everyone is really, truly lovely. Everyone is very smart. We understand the challenges of this job. And it's also not a job where unlike with on camera acting, um, no one's making $20 million a book, yeah. like the people at the top of their game, are paying their bills. That's that's what we're talking about. So there's not a huge disparity between the rock stars of the industry and the people just starting out. Um, so we can all really understand, we can still understand the struggle that everyone's going through. Um, and it, it is, it's such a supportive, wonderful community. And I wasn't expecting that. I really did not, I didn't see that coming, but this is, you know, whatever tribe narrators are that's that's my tribe <laughs> Kelsey and I have talked quite a bit about why we love audiobooks um, and we both agree that good storytelling is transformative and helps us to experience the story in a profound and memorable way could you talk to us about how you are able to create these transformative moments in your storytelling wow <laughs> Sorry, because, that's a loaded question. Yeah, it's a loaded question. But, you know, we understand um, as audiobook listeners, we've listened, both Kelsey and I have listened to a lot of audiobooks. Um, just having a great voice does not make you a great narrator. This is true. Yes. Um, sure. So I, I think I'm coming at this from the two sides of my brain always. And one is the actor side of my brain, which says, how, how am I inhabiting these characters? Because you're inhabiting all of them. That's the difference in audio versus on camera or stage, right? I'm, I'm, I've got to give each character their due. So that sort of process of figuring out the characters and the relationships, that, that I really feel is, is the actor part of me um, activated. But I'm also coming at it from my writer sensibilities, which is what is the what is the author trying to accomplish? How can I help them convey that to a listener who doesn't have the physical words in front of them necessarily? And what is their voice and what is their character, the voice of the book, and how can I serve that character? So to me, and that's why that's why whenever someone, you know, I think all of us, all of us narrators, we get a lot of emails from people being like, you know, I've been told I have a great voice and I should be doing this. And it's always like, yeah, OK, but, <laughs> you know, I I can't tell somebody just that you have a good voice, that you're going to be suited to this job. It's so many more things. Um, but to me, that that's where like the intersection of those two sensibilities um, and two practices kind of come to bear on how do I, as you said, 
I'm a storyteller. That's really what I think this job is. And so all of those different components and the different ways of looking at the different components is how I put together the game plan for telling that particular story. And I think in doing that, you really create that emotional investment in the story that I think we as listeners feel that, you know, you can almost kind of tell if a narrator is like not super committed to what they're reading or just like anybody that you hear, you're like, oh, like it just loses something. And well, and I think that that's something about, you know, we always tell actors, the first thing you learn in like acting class is like you can't judge a character, right? You just you just have to where there's no judgment here. You are just you have to find something to love in the character. And as much as I think like that is oversimplifying whatever that task is of acting, but I I do think that that applies to the books. Like you have to find something to love in the books that you record. And, you know, sometimes a book may not be my personal taste. It's not something I would pick up if I were in a library, but I will find something to love about it. And again, as a writer, I understand like what went into this book. And so I'm going to be very sympathetic to the author's journey here. Um, and so, yeah. And so I think that I, I will find myself getting caught up in books and in the performance. And, you know, and as you get, as you've d- been doing this, I've been doing this a while now and you just learn like what works and what doesn't and how far is too far. And um, having that, always making it about the book. It's not really about, you as the narrator it's not about what your performance is it's about how best to serve the book i think that uh, you know we've kind of touched on it a little bit um but your debut novel my oxford year uh, which came out in 2018 from harper collins publishing was met with critical acclaim and international success um could you tell our listeners a little bit about my oxford year um yeah wow it's been it's been so long since I've had to like do the elevator pitch on this book I'm trying to remember what I used to say okay what I used to say is it is about a young woman who goes to Oxford on a Rhodes um and she has a political career she she's a political operative and she has a she's hired at the last minute to work on a presidential campaign And um, she's giving herself this year in Oxford to experience life and poetry. And of course, she meets a man and uh, he is hiding a secret. Bum, bum, bum. (laughs) Uh, It's a it's a rom dramedy. I like like to say Uh, it is a love story um, that goes in unexpected places. Yeah, we, Kelsey and I, uh, being librarians, we read a lot of book reviews. And my personal opinion is that Kirkus tends to be um, sometimes the toughest, or mm-hmm. maybe it's the most <laughs> honest, I don't know. But, you know, just as um, kind of a cool thing about this book that, you know, their review of my Oxford year said, um, you know, Waylon has created a beautiful romantic story that focuses on big ideas, love, death, poetry, and what really matters in the end. So I don't think this is your typical, you know, romantic story. I think there's a lot more depth to this story um, than what a typical romance reader might pick up. And I'm yes, not... and that's why I'm always careful. No, but that's why I'm careful with, I mean, it was very lovely that very early on, like the very first kind of just blogger reviews I got were out of the romance community and they were amazingly supportive because as someone who has narrated a lot of romance, I did not, I never thought that this book fell into that category. And so I always feel I'm always on the side of like cautioning people, like, you know, just don't get, don't expect <laughs> too much from like, it's going to be different than what you think it's going to be. Um, but at the same time, I never want to put myself in the position of, you know, apologizing for the book, but I definitely do feel that it's one of those books that just doesn't totally fall into any particular category. And for those who are interested in audiobooks, you also narrated My Oxford Year. I did. And was that super challenging? (laughs) So I, I kept challenging and super rewarding. I mean, it just all the feelings about it was, uh, it was, I wish I could have enjoyed it more, but it was so difficult. Um, 
And I, I will say that, like, objectively, the book is difficult. It's first person present. So everything is very immediate. We are very much in a character's head. There's kind of like no break. So it's a little bit relentless in the narration, which, of course, I didn't think about until I was reading it out loud. And then it's also we have like one American in a group of, you know, 13 Brits. And so trying to create distinct voices and characters for all of the um, the characters that populate Ella's world was challenging. So it was it was challenging, like on its face. It would have been a very challenging book to do regardless. Um, but yeah, then being in there and trying to turn off my editorial brain as I was reading it. Um, not wanting to rewrite every sentence was difficult, difficult. <laughs> well, I, I have to admit, I have not read my Oxford year yet, but it is, it's, I'm buying the book because I, <laughs> I, I want to. I, and actually, I'd love to listen to the audiobook, so we'll have to decide which version I'm going to go with. But it's I'm a tough call. A I'm tough leaning call. towards the audiobook. <laughs> so we... Uh, mentioned in your introduction that you're a tea sommelier. You know, how long, I guess, have you been interested in tea? I will admit I didn't know that that was a thing that you could it do. It is a thing. <laughs> yeah, um, I've been, well, I mean, I've always loved tea. I didn't drink coffee until about five years ago. Um, when I, like, hit 30, and <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, I need caffeine. Yeah, that's um, a fair statement. I, so I was, I always loved tea, um, and then when I, graduated from college it occurred to me that I had been I was at a high tea in um I think it was in Chicago and I saw this guy kind of running around the tea room like a maitre d but seemed to be particularly involved with the tea and talking to people about the tea and I pulled him aside and I said I'm sorry what are you doing and he said I'm a I'm a tea master um and I just like I didn't know like you I, said, I didn't know that was a thing and um so I went through a a training course. And since then, this has actually become more accessible. There are actual online classes. Like I just did a touch up class on blending recently, um, just to kind of refresh because I haven't actively used it in a long time. But for, I did, when I was promoting my Oxford year, I made a special blend for that book. (laughs) It's, it's called staircase eight, but I never sold it. I never did any, it was just a kind of a giveaway promotional thing. Um, but yeah, I love, I love tea and, um, it's always kind of in the back of my head wondering if there's something more to be done with it, but my plate's pretty full right now. (laughs) And I want to love tea, but I (laughs) just, every time I try it, I don't know, I just have that little. This is my favorite game. No, this is my favorite game. Okay. What is it that you don't, you don't love about tea? Oh, uh, well, I've. I don't want to, I don't want to like be insulting, but I feel like it's dirty water sometimes. <laughs> Understandable. It doesn't have the flavor profile. So yeah, I, I, someday maybe as Are I- Are you a coffee drinker? I am a coffee drinker probably since Do you I, drink your coffee with milk and sugar? Um, sometimes. Depends on my mood. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but- But do you like a strong cup of coffee? I do. Okay. So I always tell people, see, this is where, this is where I start in. I always tell people that for the coffee drinkers who just like don't get tea because they think it's, it's weak and they don't have much flavor. I would start with very flavor, flavorful teas, like a pu'er, um, like a lapsing shoe song, which has like a very smoky campfire smell to it. you feel like you're on the trail. It's that those types of teas that are kind of flavor and scent bombs are good gateways. That's all. I'm I taking say. notes. So <laughs> she is even I'm a, I'm I do love tea. I drink both tea and okay. coffee, but Jen's taking notes for both of us. I'm like, I'm gonna have to try those yep. now. Well, thank you for the recommendation. I feel like that was definitely a bonus to this <laughs> yeah. interview. Sure. A little listener bonus. Yeah. <laughs> um so as we're kind of wrapping up, are you able to share any upcoming projects that you'll be working on? I heard there's a new book coming soon. What I can say is that there is another book in the works and there will be news on that soon. <laughs> we will keep our eyes peeled for sure. We'll just keep our listeners at the edge of their seats. Be like, you just have to keep an eye out. Yes. Yes. Um, but there is actually... Um, I don't know. 
give me one second while I pause and look something up. I want to see if I can talk about this um, on the audio side of things. Yeah, so because... here's a, um, oh. a strange kind of connection. So we interviewed uh, Victoria Schwab, mm. and then I said I have to reach out to Julia Whalen because I was, um, and then I ended up you know, doing, seeing all these books that you had narrated and I was totally down the rabbit hole. And um, then I ended up picking up a book just because it was a new book in the library and had no understanding that there was a connection to you until after I was halfway into the book. But um, The People We Keep by Alison mm. Larkin. So I yes. read that one. I'm like, and she narrated this. And I really enjoyed that book. Um, and she, of course she narrated this one well too. that book so the people we keep um is very special to me because actually Allie's first book stay was um a book I did early on in my career and Allie and I became friends through that experience and so I had read a couple of drafts of the people we keep over the last six years or so just kind of checking in with her I knew how much this book meant to her and um, I was there kind of watching her journey of trying to find a home for this book and other people who understood what it was and gave her notes when I could. And, and so it's a very personal thing to me. And I love that book so much and have, I feel like I kind of, um, you know, was involved in the rearing of it. <laughs> and so I, I, that is, a, it's spectacular. And I'm so glad that people are finding it now. Um, and it's just it's one of those really gratifying publishing stories, which doesn't happen all that often. But when someone just gets the recognition and the accolades they deserve for something that they have tried to um, protect for as long as she has. And it's just great. Yeah, I don't um, get real emotional often when I read books, but I, I had tears. April broke my heart. You know, I, it's such a fully formed character. It was, it I was, mean, the first yeah. paragraph of that book is like, yeah, this girl just jumps off the page. Yeah. Um, she is going to stay with me for a while, for sure. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So good. So good. So one of the books that I have coming up, which I'm seeing is coming out on the 7th. And so next week um, is there is a never before published Simone de Beauvoir novel. Oh, yeah, called wow. Inseparable. And Gabber Zachman and I got to do it together. And it's a very it was a very personal story based on um, Simone's relationship with her best friend who died young. And so the book is this novel, which is really more like a novella length, and then has letters from the real Simone to her friend and back and forth at the end. And there's an amazing introduction also by Margaret Atwood that uh that gabber reads and it's just spectacular add it to the list yep. Kelsey. <laughs> yeah <laughs> make sure we've got that one on order yeah yeah our thanks to you julia for joining us in conversation today it has been a pleasure to chat with you yeah we look forward to um continuing to be listeners <laughs> thank and, you and i look forward to continuing to record <laughs> yeah. um but this was just lovely and you had some great questions. So thank you for having me. 